Welcome back to the FeeCast. We are here again after another week of interesting news and ideas to talk about that news and ideas through the economic lens. And with me today, I'm Richard Lawrence, of course, is Brittany Hunter, Dan Sanchez, and our very special guest, Anna Jane Peril, joining us this week. And we're going to be talking about some interesting things this week because, as there always is, discussion about the isms, the deadly and not so deadly isms. We're talking, of course, of political labels. Everyone always wants to throw around labels identifying themselves as either a socialist or a communist or maybe a liberal, maybe a progressive even, libertarian, conservative. All these labels go around all the time, but we thought we'd take a moment this time and actually go through what exactly these labels actually mean. And so we're going to be taking three labels and talking about them a little bit here. And the first label that we've chosen today to talk about is liberalism. And I think this is a really interesting one to start with because it's actually changed quite a bit in meaning over the past couple of centuries. And so, as with anything, when you want to know the definition of a word, where do you go? Wikipedia. Wikipedia. I, I, I went to Merriam-Webster. <laughs> oh, classic. <laughs> because it can't be edited as easily. Um, and so people can't alter the all right, term. All right, all right. You kind of have to go through that <laughs> committee of overlords who actually decide what the definition of a word every is. Every great speech begins. Because a bit too liberal. <laughs> every great oh, speech begins damn. with a definition. <laughs> well, according to Merriam-Webster, liberalism is in the top 10% of words, by the way, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. Liberalism is a theory in economics emphasizing individual freedom from restraint and usually based on free competition, the self-regulating market, and the gold standard. Now that is uh, definition 2B. 2A has to do with Protestantism. We're not really talking about that here today. 2C for liberalism is a political philosophy based on belief in progress, the essential goodness of the human race, and on autonomy of the individual and standing for the protection of political and civil liberties. So this is a little, I saw a little bit of uh, befuddlement in faces here because I think this may be the reverse of what we yeah. expected it might be. Mm -hmm. What would you say liberalism is? I thought it would be what we call progressivism, I guess. I, when I think of liberalism and all my friends that subscribe to that or call themselves liberals, they're all Obama supporters or even Bernie Sanders supporters, but they're definitely not on the free market end of the political right, spectrum. Right, so that gold standard <laughs> stuff that, that uh, would not competition. Yeah, well, I, figure out, I didn't know gold standard would come into any sort of definition that you see. Huh. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of strange. If this could actually hyperlink me, I could press on gold standard because it says see gold standard. Did you just and try to press on it? Right I did. <laughs> and I'm sure our sound guys are going to hate me for doing that because I'm pressing on things <laughs> and making sound. But no, I actually was surprised that this, the first definition for political liberalism was more of a classical liberalism. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense chronologically, because that is what liberalism meant when it first became a political ideology word. Uh, it, it really did mean belief in the free market and in individual liberty in general, but then especially over the course of the 20th century, and especially in America, that it started to evolve to mean the opposite in a lot of ways, that it was deep skepticism towards the free market, and in a lot of ways, uh, skepticism towards individual liberty. It's, it's not quite the case uh, in Europe and South America as much. When people say liberal in there, oftentimes they mean what we used to mean in the 19th century. Right. So, so you're saying that in other countries, classical, like classical liberalism, which is, is definitely different than I toss around the concept of liberal. Um, so you're saying that that is actually still commonly, when we talk about liberals in other countries, it's still referring to that kind of traditional or, or founding idea of liberalism rather than the way that we use it in this century. Yes. And I think part of that might be because liberalism I don't know if it was ever very much of a word in America because it's just what everybody was. Yeah. Everybody mm -hmm. just yeah. believed in freedom, and so they didn't even need a word for that. I mean, but liberalism was the doctrine of our founding fathers. And there's a certain strain of thought that says conservatives, who in many cases today can consider themselves to be classical liberals, are conserving the classical liberalism that's, of the founding of yep, the country. That's how I learned it in college. Right. Yeah, we were conserving the ways of the past where the liberals were trying to free themselves from capitalism. You I, know, did not type know, of thing. I did not know the origin of conservative. And, and conservative and liberal in the U.S. totally right. different. Right, they're totally in, in tension now. Yeah. 
So, yeah. but you wrote a piece on this. I did on specifically Mises' uh, definition of liberalism, which of course is the definition the 2A or whatever the first one right. said, which is more one of a, a, autonomy, individual rights, individual liberty, and free market competition. And Mises, of course, is the famous economist the of the Austrian school. The godfather of the school. Austrian school of economics, and, <laughs> yes. And he wrote that in the 20s, and even then he was remarking that when people use this word, that he, he named his book liberalism, but he had to, at the beginning, set out that even now people mean opposite. Um, and, and it was really kind of ironic because it was sort of the... Um, the conservatives were actually enemies of the liberals in terms of the free market liberals, especially in um, in England. And so Herbert Spencer talked about how it's just weird that these people who are calling themselves liberals, that really what he, he, they're what he called the new Tories, yeah. that, that they're, they're like the conservatives of old because the, the Tories were representatives of aristocratic privilege and, um, and econo especially the economic privilege of the aristocracy. In Britain. Mm -hmm, in, in Britain. And, um, but then the new Tories he called were, uh, they were, they wanted the same government intervention that the old Tories wanted, but for the sake of the people instead of the right. sake of the aristocracy. And to your earlier point, we were talking about the way liberalism, the word is used in different countries. Liberalism was actually written in German, correct? Yes. So it actually, I mean, that could have had a whole different meaning there than maybe it did at the same time here. That's true. He probably had to have extra specifics for his American audience. Yeah. I'm really curious about the, the, I guess, the evolution of why do we, and this is a very specific to American culture, why do we use like liberals that we think of as very kind of, I mean, for lack of a better way to think about it, left-leaning in the political scale, um, where the evolution of that word I mean, from what it meant in classical liberalism um, to what it means now, I'm just super curious. And I was kind of, when you were reading, I think it's 2C or whichever, the last definition, you kind of talk a lot about like human flourishing and, sure. and you know, those ideas that I think transcend left and right political spectrum concepts. Um, so maybe that's part of it is that, you know, there's this underlying respect for human dignity that comes from the liberal perspective that may speak to and inform the evolution of that word. It might be. Yeah. It might be. And, and, but I do want to move on because what you referred to there was a time in the 20th century when this word actually <laughs> changed in the progressive era. And that was the next term that I was going to get to, which is uh, actually, uh, FYI, in the bottom 30% of words on uh, Merriam-Webster. What are these percentages? You mean in terms of like searching? Popularity. Or popularity. Popularity of so use? Just liberalism, top 10% popular, I guess 10 Across English usage? Wh whoever's using... Got a lot of questions about Probably the dictionary. I bet who's using the okay. dictionary, what okay. they're searching for. So progressivism is in the bottom 30%. Definition of progressivism here... And this doesn't really help us. The principles, <laughs> beliefs, and practices of progressives. So, of course, <laughs> I went to progressive. One that is progressive. Okay, that's easy. No. Um, one believing in moderate political change and especially social improvement by government action. Which is entirely the opposite of the liberalism definition you just read. <laughs> right. And so, you're exactly right. And so, when this word became popular in the late 19th century, early 20th century, the progressive movement began... And it didn't exactly 100% flourish. There were a lot of things that stood in its way. Then, I believe, liberalism actually became sort of co-opted, the term, by the progressives. Is that right, Danny? Yeah, and the way Herbert Spencer explained it is that basically people who called themselves liberals, what classical liberalism was always about was human flourishing for the masses, but the means to that end was liberty. Right. And then the way Herbert Spencer explains it is that, well, then people only became concerned about the ends, and they wanted a more direct route to those ends. And, and no so, more direct route than the one entity that can do it all, which is government. Exactly. Who is the greatest enemy of the individual, which is the whole point of original liberalism. Right. So it's, yeah. <laughs> and pr progressive is interesting because it kind of, uh, sort of the antithesis of progressive is reactionary. And so mm. it's, it's almost like this idea of the history marching on towards like a predetermined destiny. Right. Wait, what do you mean what what do you mean by that? When you say progressivism is the antithesis to reaction, like, what do you what are you saying? So the idea is that reactionaries are people who are reacting to movements towards progress, especially 
movements that take away their privileges. So the original reactionaries were the aristocrats who had um, special economic privileges that, that they, the, the land was tied to their families and certain people were serfs and they were, they were tied to, to work for their, these families. And so when that's, the liberals started breaking that down, and th so the original reactionaries were the people who were saying, wait a minute, what about all of our special privileges? Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we want to keep them. Um, but then, as, especially as socialism became an ideal, then the word reactionary started meaning uh, economic royalists, so people who wanted to keep their privileges of just retaining their own property and being free to do what they want with their okay, own. Okay, so, it, so became, it was an elite perspective, and then it became kind of, it, it, it was co not co-opted, it wasn't, you're saying that it was then applied to people who just wanted to keep their property? Yes. Oh, okay. Hmm. So we're going to talk more about this. Danny and Brittany are just wealths of information about this. We've got another big definition that we're going to get into in just a second, but we're going to take a quick break, and we'll see you after that. One year ago, over 700 students, scholars, philanthropists, and business leaders from five continents gathered in Atlanta for a brand new, one-of-a-kind event, FeeCon. But get ready, this year is going to be even bigger. At FeeCon, we celebrate inspiring entrepreneurs, innovators, and wealth creators while helping you set your own path to personal and professional success. And it was awesome. All around, it's been like a vacation. It will become a must attend event next year as well. I'm not going to wait for my invitation. I'm going to invite myself, I guess. So, With FeeCon 2018, Fee is taking the conference experience to a whole new level. With eight incredible tracks, more than 50 jam-packed sessions featuring over 100 electrifying speakers and vast networking opportunities. FeeCon 2018 is sure to offer an unforgettable experience for everyone. It's the must-attend event this summer, and it's all happening at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in beautiful downtown Atlanta from June 7th through 9th. Available tickets are going fast, so register now at FeeCon.org and find out how you can set your path and change the world. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We were talking before the break about progressivism, of course, and liberalism. And now we wanted to go into a different definition, a different word, because this is a word I think that's misused a lot as well. And this word so happens to be in the top 1% of lookups on Merriam-Webster, hmm. which is interesting, and that word is socialism. And we hear that word bandied about in all sorts of different contexts today. Um, and this word actually doesn't have that much difference uh, across the pond, as it were. It is used pretty similarly here in the U.S. and down in Latin America and over in Europe, over in Africa and Asia and Australia, pretty much everywhere, has the same conception of socialism, even though the popular conception may be a little bit different. And so the definition of socialism, according to Merriam-Webster, is one of the political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods. And then 2A is a system of society or group living in which there is no private property. Hmm. So it kind of gets into the means of production, the economic side, as well as sort of the rule of law, who can own property. One thing it didn't say that surprised me is social justice, which I hear so many mm -hmm. of my socialist friends say, which it's about equality for all. Yeah. And, you know, it, I didn't hear that mentioned. Yeah, that's what I, it's, <laughs> it was really more focused on, which surprised me that like it's about specifically the the means of production, yep. which yeah. I did not uh, anticipate seeing in a definition like that, um, because I think that we think about things like um, yeah, caring about others and equality, social, as, right? Social yeah, socialism. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and the goods and services that we as a government decide to give people. Um, really what's defining about socialism, at least it sounds like, is it's, it's, the, it's what the government owns or and what I, you don't own. Yes. And, and I think that was another evolution uh, because of how history played out. Because what happened is that socialism became an obvious failure. And it became even obvious to a lot of socialists. And so whereas the Marxists they would stress the economic aspect and especially uh, government ownership of the means of production. But as we 
it became obvious that around the world that there were so, the socialist economies were were doing very badly and people were really suffering and starving even that that then they started to emphasize s sort of more of the cultural mm -hmm. aspects and more of the like less the economic aspects. Which do you think is more dangerous? Somebody who's an economic socialist or somebody who's a social socialist or cares more about people I don't or money? No, if social socialist even exists because if mm -hmm. you're looking at it in the correct mm -hmm. light, it's totally economic. It's all yeah. And so Danny mentioned Marx, right? Karl Marx, of course, the author of the Communist Manifesto, Das Kapital, ostensibly, I think people sometimes refer to him as the person who invented the term capitalism. I'm not entirely sure that that's correct, but he, of course, had an anniversary uh, recently, so people are talking birthday, about him right? a lot. Birthday, I think? 200th, is it the 200th anniversary of his birth? Mm -hmm. It was last week or the week before. Um, and he's referred to, actually, in definition three, which is socialism is a stage of society in Marxist theory transitional between capitalism and communism. It's the, it's the yeah, pre-stage, right? It's right, right before mm -hmm. they take over everything. Well, well, if you get to full communism, which is a term that you get to hear about a lot when you're talking going with folks. Going full communism. Going full communist, <laughs> then you have no government at all, right? It's yeah. basically a anarchy of the proletariat, of the working class, On right? On paper. On paper. <laughs> so socialism as a stage in Marxist theory is the only stage that socialist or communist countries have ever, ever actually gotten to. Yeah. Socialism by itself is not welfare statism. It's not big government providing good uh, mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. to people or services at all. It is simply when government begins to own the means of production. It is an economic theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's really the definition that, I mean, that uh, just understanding the difference between, yeah, it's not what it's providing, it's what it owns. That's what matters. Um, and that's really the definition of socialism because I think that we, and it's like means or ends, right? And um, and I think that when we talk about it, at least in you know in my common cultural context, um, it is very much the means. What is what is the government giving us? Mm -hmm. I want socialism because I believe in, you know, they we need all to give us things. Kind of yes. thing, like we all deserve, okay. But the, but the necessary, what you're saying is the necessary precursor to that is really what we need to focus on, which is government ownership of means of production. But if the government owns the means of production, the government's also controlling who gets those means yes. of production. So yeah. in a lot of way, there is that, that overlap. Yeah, yeah. And so it's we like, have an yeah. article making the case that you can't have political or personal freedom without economic freedom. Because if the government owns the means of production, sure, you might even have freedom of speech uh, in the Constitution, but if they can send to a labor camp in Siberia anyone whose speech they don't like, then you, do you really have personal or political freedom? And I think that comes back to everything is economics. I mean, that's how you know we at Fee yeah. obviously <laughs> believe that um, that every you know decision making is economics. Everything is economics. So when you say there isn't really just social socialism, it is. It's always a question of economics. It yeah. is a question of who makes who makes what and who has ownership over what. Well, and that gets to the term that Danny was using, the means of production, which I think is sometimes maybe a bit. Uh, obtuse for people. They yeah. might not understand exactly what that means. Econ lingo. Yeah, sure. means of production. <laughs> Danny, how would you describe it? So means of production are any goods that are used for producing either other producers' goods or consumers' goods. So that means capital. So capital goods are uh, so like factories and tools, but, uh, but it also means labor. So labor is a means of, of production. And so under a, a communist or socialist economy, the, the government owns all the capital goods, but they also determine who does what job. And in fact, on that note, I heard today that down in Venezuela, we've talked about Venezuela a lot lately, Kellogg is actually shutting down yeah. its factory there because of the uncertain situation. So it wasn't one of the industries, cereal making industry, it was not one of the industries that was nationalized, meaning taken over by the government in a socialist sort of plan. But they find that the situation is so dire there. I mean, people are starving. People are starving. There was a point at which people were actually being told by the government to eat rocks. And now there's a situation in which Kellogg, which is making food for people, is being closed out of business or choosing to go out of business there temporarily until the situation improves. It's sad. And like you said, every place that this has been tried, you've never been able to get quite to full-on communism. There's always been a collapse, like what happened with the Soviet Union, like what happened before Deng Xiaoping reformed the uh, People's Republic of China. This is always a repeating thing over and over again. I mean, you, you look no further than in North Korea, right? The contrast. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But one of the things that I think people talk about when they refer to socialism is sort of this 
like you were saying, Anna Jane, nice things, right? So we talk about in Scandinavia, there are mm-hmm. so many nice things that those governments give people. We all we are all the same, yeah, right? Exactly. That is that is what I take issue with when you talk about Scandinavia and what you know what is Scandinavia? What is that? I don't Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark. Okay. That yeah, I feel like that's, that's, those are the ones that people toss around. And they're like, no, but life is so much better when you have a when you have a socialist approach to life. Um, is that we all get the same things, um, but we are all the same people. I think that's an arg- I mean, I guess that's just the difference between a huge and and vastly different country that like America from a country like Sweden. Well, um, and their welfare state, sure, they may all get childcare provided by the state, but they're all paying for that. So, say somebody yeah. like me who does not have children, I'm still paying taxes for childcare. Never going to get. But is that socialism? No, because when you look at the actual economy of these countries, who owns the means of production? So it's welfare statism. It's welfare statism. It's a big central government yep. that taxes a lot, mm-hmm. and that removes purchasing power from the individuals, mm-hmm. and then redistributes it from the top in the form of different services such as education, child care, child care, all that sort of stuff. And actually, while they do have relatively high taxes and a relatively large welfare state, in a lot of other ways, they're actually very economically free. Mm-hmm. That uh, and actually even more so than the U- the U.S. in a lot of ways. How's that? that? It uh, that their trade policy that they're more open to free trade. Mm-hmm. Their regulatory policy uh, is is lighter. Regulatory policy meaning just regulations on different areas in the economy. Yeah, especially like getting products passed even like like state of approval type of thing. Mm-hmm. And especially corporations and especially corporate taxes are are relatively. Mm-hmm. Low. And that plays a big part of like I mean the uh, what is the index for economic freedom and yeah. like the U.S is not high on that list. I mean, it's not super high on that well, list. Well, it's been dropping every yeah. year for the past and, decade. And I imagine several of those countries surpass us on that list. And you're talking about, I mean, these are countries we perceive as as like socialist countries. Um, again, in the concept of the way that we toss around that idea now, but it is they are actually very much not, is what you're saying, because they still, um, ownership of the means of production is still private. That's right. Yep. So, yeah. for so ex- that's the big difference. Right. Example, in, uh, in fiscal policy, um, Sweden is actually eighth, and Denmark is seventh for the most free, and the U.S. is all the way down in 24th. Wow. And that's why a lot of big countries, I mean, not of countries, a lot of um, big businesses do uh, find themselves in Europe as their headquarters because of, because of the lack of freedom for corporations here. I mm-hmm. mean, and fiscal policy, sometimes. of course, is the way in which the government sets its taxing and spending policies. That's right. And so it, that was Sweden, right? Mm-hmm. So Sweden seems like it's actually doing pretty well there. Uh, at least with the population and the tax base that it can manage. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Sweden's interesting for another uh, case as well, and that is because it's a mixed economy. And that's a notion of, you know, it's not fully socialist, it's not fully capitalist, where all the means of production are in private hands. But I think there's a good point to be made that a mixed economy is actually more socialist than it may otherwise seem, right? Because through regulatory policy, how much do the private owners of a company actually have the ability mm-hmm. to command what they own? And so in a mixed economy, you, you do find very um, distinct signs of socialist policy simply because if you can't do with your property what you believe is in the best interest of your customers, then what good is owning it, right? Yeah, M- Mises talks about two paths towards socialism. That you, There's outright nationalization where the government could just take over whole industries, or there's regulation that through regulation after regulation, uh, it really becomes private ownership only in name right. because really it's the government calling the shots. We'll post a link to Mises' work as well as some other articles, I think, by Dan Mitchell that you're referring to here uh, underneath the video. But we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back after this message. If you want to have a career in the creative arts, you want to be at FeeCon. Over the past 15 years, I've held a variety of creative positions, starting as an assistant music supervisor in New York City, and then working as a composer and music editor in Los Angeles, and for the past several years as a filmmaker and producer. One thing I've learned is that success as a creative professional isn't just about mastering your craft. It also takes entrepreneurship, discipline, and passion, and there are always plenty of challenges along the way. FeeCon is a three-day conference designed to educate and empower students and young professionals like you. This year, we're presenting a track especially for aspiring creatives, where you'll learn about breaking into your desired industry, honing your craft, how to turn your creativity into profit, and more. We're bringing in a ton of pros from different industries, including film, publishing, music, and visual arts, and giving you plenty of Q&A time to get answers to your biggest questions. 
So join us at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in downtown Atlanta from June 7th through 9th. We're gonna have attendees coming in from all over the world, but we really want to make sure locals have a chance to experience this incredible event. So be sure to register at becon.org and use the promo code ATLANTA to get your tickets for just $25. Get ready to launch your creative career. I'll see you at FeeCon. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We were just talking in the break about the Swedish number that you mentioned, and we were realizing that that number was actually everything but fiscal policy. That's right. So they are number what in terms of everything else, like ease of doing business? Right. So in particular, trade policy, regulatory policy, monetary policy, rule of law, and property rights. So rankings for factors other than fiscal policy. Right, so other than taxing and spending, then uh, Denmark is number seven, Sweden is number eight, and the United States is number 24. Right, and of course, you know the welfare state stuff goes into yeah. So what? Yeah, spending. what does that take into account? So fiscal policy. If we remove fiscal policy, what like what does that show us? So you're saying fiscal policy being sorry, fiscal policy being welfare spending and taxing. If we remove that as a part of analyzing this, what do we see? Then we see that uh, the Scandinavian countries, at least these two Scandinavian countries, are actually more economically free if you factor out. So it's a little policies. bit more comfortable for businesses and people to live there yeah. and, and trade. And specifically mm -hmm. because maybe there's fewer regulations, or like mm -hmm. you said, the ease of doing business is, is easier. <laughs> so, right. yeah. Which makes sense to a degree, because you think of regulation, I mean, that's what really ties up and impedes and breaks the market. Right. It's like, if, if you have a functioning market, then yeah, you might be able to skim off, uh, off the top quite a bit and redistribute it, because it's still able to create wealth. Absolutely. And we were actually looking in the break also at our friends up at the Fraser Institute. They have an economic freedom ranking, and this takes into account all of the different factors, the fiscal policy, the monetary policy, you know, how you treat money in the country, along with the regulatory side of things. And the U.S. in this ranking is number 11, Denmark is number 15, and Finland is number 17. And so you find, when you're looking at this stuff, that economic freedom is actually correlated to happiness. And this has been proven time and time again. This is not a little study that actually uh, the country of Bhutan has tried to put out there into the world saying that, well, economic freedom doesn't really matter, GDP doesn't really matter, we're measuring our citizens' happiness. It doesn't sound like it really stands scientific scrutiny all that well. I also tend to think, okay, if they're controlling the economy that much, how much are they also controlling the results of that test? That's a good question. <laughs> you know, that's that's a very good. Well, actually, speaking of control, we were talking before the last segment ended about mixed economies. And this was a term that I think a lot of economic textbooks actually contain. And when I think of a mixed economy, I think of maybe something like what the United States has, kind of a mix between uh, capitalist free market economy with characteristics maybe more resembling a uh, welfare state. But the question always comes to mind, who decides on the mix? How do you know you have the right mix? Yeah. Well, uh, right now, sorry, Anna Jane, <laughs> we're, not, we're not allowed to pick. I mean, we really don't. We can vote with our dollars, but at the same time, in many ways, the government does tell us what we can vote with our dollars with. Because if the FDA hasn't approved something, then I'm not allowed to go spend my dollars on that. You know, so when you think about this, we don't have that control. I would like to say we have that control. Well, what do you say? That's what do you say to somebody who's like, well, voting is your control. That's mm. that's you're deciding who decides, right? That's what voting is, um, and that's how we're empowered. Ooh. But that kind of voting <laughs> is a very win lose scenario. Mm -hmm. So the the voting with your dollar, um, you. You get a you get to influence the market, but not exclusively. So so other people also get to vote with their dollars, and so it's it everybody can win to some extent. There's actually a school of thought that's taught pretty widely these days called the public choice school yeah. that tries to apply and I think does so very well economic theories and ideas and principles onto politics. And what one of its progenitors called it originally was politics without the romance. Mm -hmm. So not quite imagining that the savior could come into office and make everything perfect for us. 
um, but actually applying economics and things such as incentives mm -hmm. to actually understanding why politicians may promise a lot of things, right? Yeah. But they don't deliver on those things. Yeah, you things. see, I think when you apply when you apply economic thinking to the political process, you get things like gerrymandering. I mean, that's a very obvious observation. Um, you, I mean, look at median voter theory theorem, is that what it's called? Um, I mean, when you look at, at economic thinking as applied to politics, we get rid of thinking about personalities and, and ideals and values, and you actually think about human decision making, which is what economics is when you boil it down. Um, and you see that we get a lot of, of, of bad outcomes. And it's kind of ironic because a lot of people accuse believers in the free market of being naive yes. about human nature because they think, oh, well, you think that people are just angels and if you let them free, that they'll do the right thing. But people who believe in agents of government correcting for that they are putting the angels' wings on the agents of government. And what they're saying is, I don't trust us as individuals. I don't trust my fellow individual to make a decision. So I'm going to make one of those individuals have the right to make decisions. Or like a that, group of those individuals. Yeah. That concept yeah. doesn't make any sense to me. It's just, it, you're assuming that, yeah, it, it's, it, to me, believing in a higher authority to make decisions actually speaks to you believing in people less than, hmm. say, somebody who wants individual I think rights. that's perfectly yeah. said. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the assumption that we can't all do the right thing on an individual level. We have to pick somebody to choose for us. That means that you have less faith in humanity than somebody who believes in individual Appeal to rights. authority, to right? Me. That's how yeah. all authoritarianism starts in general. The tyranny of the expert. Oh. <laughs> this reminds me of a fabulous book which has been read sometimes quoted many times, and in <laughs> fact, you recently read it and you live blogged it, and that was The Road to Serfdom. The Road to Serfdom. And this is an explanation by the Nobel laureate economist F.A. Hayek, where he talked about how when you try to pursue the middle of the road, you inevitably end up with disastrous results, similar to what you described, Dan, earlier about socialism being abandoned everywhere it's been tried in force. The road to serfdom really goes into that. Yeah, in fact, there's one piece uh, that I wrote to toot my own horn on that one um, called "You Give." I think it was "You Give the Government an Inch, They'll Take a Mile," something to that extent. But that is essentially what Hayek is saying: that either direction, if you're capitulating, you're giving state someone, some governing body, some more authority over the individual. Right. You can't have that middle road because it's going to lead to maybe not socialism, but authoritarianism in general. Serfdom. Serfdom, tyranny, tyranny whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and Hayek has another chapter in that book called um, Why the Worst Get on Top. Yes. And, and it just talks about how with uh, central planning, that, that the lure of power and the lure of, of loot and being able to, to um, tax and regulate and control people's lives, that it, it draws the worst people in, into power. And, um, and then Ludwig von Mises, who was a mentor of Hayek, he had an essay called uh, the middle of the road policy leads to socialism. And he points out that even when you have what people call a mixed economy, that every time you have an intervention, there's always going to be uh, negative uh, unintended consequences. There's a cost. Mm -hmm. and, and then what happens is that if you try to ameliorate those consequences with another policy, then that has more consequences. And so you're just... Um, Compounding almost, right? Exactly. Pulling and all the levers, yeah. turning all the knobs, everything's got a cost, there's going to be a reaction somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw one question out here to close, and that is, what does all this matter to us? Why do we actually think that this is important to talk about with people who are listening to us today? Words matter. Um, and I say that as a writer, <laughs> so I really think words matter. Right. But if you're going to start at an axiom point, at a point of reason with everybody, you have to have the same definition. If yeah. you and I are talking about different definitions of socialism, we're never going to agree because we're never even going to start from the same point. Totally. And so this comes into you know, communication. We can't communicate with other people and spread these ideas if we can't start at the same point. And there can't be a politics without good communication. Yeah. And for me, it's not only that the worst get on top under big government, but it brings out the worst in us yeah. individually that it, it makes us more greedy. People talk about capitalism uh, bringing out greed, but if anything, it's the promise of free college and free healthcare and free everything, that that is what brings out the, the class warrior. The in entitlement almost, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I couldn't say it better than Brittany. I think that words matter. Um, and I just think that specifically the ideas of what, you know, what is a liberal, what is progressivism, um, what is socialism, we are tossing these around so frequently um, in today's, you know, cultural context, like I've said. Um, I think that it's important we understand, at least from what I see, that there is economic 
indicators within all of those concepts that, that m many people don't consider when they're using those words. Um, so thinking about what your understanding of um, economics and how it plays into those concepts um, it is so key to me to using those words effectively. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> well, thank you all for everything that you've said today on the panel, and we look forward to seeing everyone next week on the FeeCast. Have a great weekend. Thank you.